Would baptism be the same if it were simply a series of questions to answer? No. Going under the water is part of it. It's the physical world and the spiritual world meeting together and intersecting and something happens. It has an efficacious effect. The water has to be there. We are using it to mediate our relationship with God. In a sense, we're doing what God asked us to do and we're understanding what baptism is because we go under the water. All right, you guys. So we are on to episode three. Sarah, you did such a great t- job last time oh, of talking you. us through what happened in the biblical scriptures. I got really curious about what happens next. Like, how, does this stuff disappear? How does all of this happen during history? What do you, What are your guys' initial thoughts on that? Well, um, there are reports that Joseph was a village seer i I don't Mm -hmm. really know exactly what that meant i know that he he was able to like find lost objects with the seer stone and there was another at least one other seer in palmyra as well so i I don't know how prevalent it was Mm -hmm. i don't know exactly what they did or how they discovered that ability i I have no idea in our world if i came up to you sarah and said hey i'm going to be the village seer (laughs) you would have some questions i I would think you were nuts you would think i was had absolutely lost it yeah, I mean, I already know you, so I already know you're a little nuts, but mm-hmm. that that would be would a confirm lot. it. You would <laughs> yeah. totally confirm it. It makes no sense in our world. None. Did it make sense in Joseph's world? And, and can I chime in on that mm-hmm. too? So one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that I remember thinking or hearing that like seer stones had become a little bit more commonplace in Joseph's time. But I also remember thinking, wait, didn't just like a couple hundred years ago, they started like burning witches over in Boston? <laughs> I, we're we're going to talk yeah. about that. There is this pendulum swing throughout history of accepting oh. practices and then trying to be more scientific. Okay. So absolutely. Thank you. We're going to get there. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait. All right. Let's get started with episode three. Let me give you an overview of what we're trying to accomplish with this episode. It's really hard for us modern people to understand how it made any sense in Joseph Smith's world to use things like magic in religious practices. We are scientifically minded people who understand how to prove things. And the idea of folk magic or using objects to hear from God just doesn't really go anywhere with us intuitively. But we live in our age and Joseph Smith lived in his. So how in the world did it make sense back then? In order to answer that question, we need to take a step back and look at what happened in history prior to Joseph Smith's day. In episode two, Sarah explored how people understood all of this in biblical times. And we're going to pick up just after that period and see how things develop from the fall of Rome all the way up till Joseph Smith's day. So that's a pretty big sweep of history. And obviously, Um, we're going to be leaving some things out. We're going to tell this story through a very specific lens of understanding how did people back then understand like folk magic, God using objects, all of this. Um, It might help us kind of scientifically minded people understand Joseph a little bit better on what he was doing. So first we go all the way back to the fall of Rome and try to understand what changed right there. So, 476 is the is the year that Rome falls. Um, you know that from studying history in school. That this, and you know this was a dramatic downfall for for all of humanity for that empire for sure. It ushers in the beginning of the Dark Ages. Um, things really, really change. It is impossible to understate the importance of the fall of Rome that it had on Western civilization. It was earth shattering. It not only marked the demise of the ancient world, um, but it introduced this very long protracted era where um, there's a lot of fractured political landscape. There's a severe economic decline, profound um, transformation of the cultural norms and values. Ancient Rome was this highly cultured society in a way. They placed great value on learning on education. The Romans were eager to learn from other cultures, and they adopted many ideas and practices from the Greeks and the Egyptians and and other civilizations. If it was true, they were trying to learn it. 
and they were particularly interested in philosophy and literature and the arts. Education was just highly valued then, and it was seen as a way really to improve one's social status, improve their career prospects. The Romans had a a system of public schools. They were open to all male children, um, really regardless of their social class. The schools taught all the basic subjects that you would think a person back then would need to know, reading, writing, arithmetic, and also deeper subjects like philosophy and rhetoric and law. Um, So Rome was this incredible time of learning for humanity, um, and they really believed it was the path to a good life. The education system was key to that success. The Romans were one of the most powerful and advanced civilizations in history, and their love of learning was a big part of that success. But when Rome falls, so does that culture, the the culture of education, the culture of learning what is true, no matter what culture, what, what other group it comes from, that all changes. At the beginning of the Dark Ages, It really is a very different world. So you're probably aware, um, in 313 AD, Constantine makes Christianity a legal religion. Up until then, at different times and in different places, people who said they believed in Christ could be killed, persecuted in all kinds of way. So starting in 313, it's a legal religion a legally recognized religion, and people who believe in Christ are no longer persecuted. So, in one sense, this is a great new era of acceptance. Christians don't have to die for believing in Jesus, but it's not necessarily a new era of orthodoxy, as there is a lot of mixed beliefs happening, mixing of beliefs and this kind of mixing of cultures that was happening. It's happening in spiritual beliefs, too. And during this time, Christian communities had broader acceptance of some of the non-Christian or pagan practices. They didn't really see pagans as like evil or wrong. They just saw them as like, without God. And this applied to the, the pagans' magic or folk magic practices as well. They begin to either be accepted as they are, those practices, or sometimes they are incorporated into the now legal religion of Christianity. So, here's an example. When Rome was ruling the world, they had belief in an entire pantheon of gods and goddesses. One of them was Athena, and Athena was seen as like this mother goddess. She's a kind of like supernatural guardian of the good school, the good souls of Constantinople. That's her job. Um, she watches over them. But at this point in history, people are, are not really buying into the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses as much. So they start to take the ideas that they had about somebody like Athena, this this Roman goddess, and they transfer them onto the Virgin Mary, is how it happens in this example. And She begins, Mary begins to be seen in the same role that Athena used to fill. She's this protective figure. You can see the the picture on the screen. There's Mary sort of sheltering children representing all of humanity under her cloak um, as if she were sheltering the citizens of Constantinople like Athena did. Um, So, you see this, this shift in beliefs. The Christians maybe co-opt that a tiny little bit, not in a not in a bad sense. The thinking about g- Greek gods and goddesses was out, thinking about Christianity was in, and they, they've they got to figure out what do we do with these sort of miscellaneous beliefs, so they just bring it right along with them. And you start to endow Mary with this magical kind of power that before then she didn't really have. She was Mary the Virgin, the mother of Jesus. The same thing happens in a non-religious sense, too. As you know, medical knowledge during this era is not what it is today. But they did have this like rudimentary kind of knowledge about some things. And the Greeks and the Romans had books on their understanding of medicine. But during the Dark Ages, the the education system has mostly disappeared. The, The love of learning has mostly disappeared. The people that generally had... Um, the, the access to books are, are are monks locked away in monasteries. So they take these old books and start to morph them a little bit. So during the Middle Ages, they start to refer to these books as the leech books. 
you know, like put the leech on you for, for the blood sucking. And you're looking at a picture here of one such book. Many of these books are actually still in existence, and we can kind of trace the development of folk magic or folk cures in this way, in a way through this type of literature. What happened is, is that that era, only people who could read or copy books were the monks. So some of what the monks do is just act as a scribe, just a, like a human copy machine. Not Maybe not quite the accuracy, but that's the idea. They were just to produce a duplicate of an already existing book as best as they could. But monks were also writing this kind of literature and producing it themselves and grappling with how to incorporate these pagan practices that people had been practicing since the Greek and Roman times. How do they fit that into the Christian faith? So you get Christian monks writing books with all kinds of spells and charms in them. I know that sounds weird to our modern ears. Why is a monk writing spells? Your mind might go towards, oh, this is an occultic thing. This is a, a rogue monk. But they really didn't think about it like that back then. There is one, there's one book in this genre that contains a spell on how to deal with evil elves, right? These spells um, really are sort of Christianized versions of pagan practices, and they often refer to asking God for help and using something in the physical world to move the process along. And in a few generations into the Dark Ages, almost no one remembers a time when spells and magic were not part of the Christian worldview. It, it, to illustrate this, I want to jump about 600 years deeper into the Dark Ages and talk about they call them the cunning folk in Britain. So we're going to move we're going to move to Britain. The cunning folk were considered professional or maybe semi-professional practitioners of folk magic in Britain. Um they're active throughout the Middle Evil period, it actually into the 20th century, like long after it stopped being widespread. Um but mostly they're in in the Middle Ages as cunning folk, they practiced they called it folk magic, and they also called it low magic. But this was primarily using spells and charms as part of their profession. They were mostly employed to use these things to combat things like malevolent witchcraft. They used it to locate criminals, to find missing persons or stolen property. They used them for fortune telling, for healing, for treasure hunting, and to influence people to fall in love. Something even the genie won't let you do. Belonging to the world of popular belief and custom, the cunning folk's magic has been defined as concerned with practical remedies of specific problems. But it also contained spiritual beliefs embedded into it because those old Greek and Roman beliefs have now been Christianized. So God was helping them fight the evil elves, for example, through a variety of physical means. They saw themselves as using the physical resources of the planet to do God's work. They didn't see this as anti-Christian. They didn't see this as something evil or against God. This was just part of their worldview. So, although the British cunning folk were in almost all cases Christian themselves, certain Christian theologians and church authorities believed that because maybe they were practitioners of magic— the cunning folk were actually in league with the devil and as such were akin to more overtly satanic and malevolent witches. Well, partly because of this, laws were enacted across England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales that often condemned the cunning folk and their magical practices. But there was no widespread persecution of them akin to like a witch hunt or an inquisition. Um, the government just started making some rules about you can't be in league with the devil. Apparently, you can legislate that. Who knew? It, it, largely because the most common people firmly distinguish between um, the cunning folk are the are the witches. So people hear about them. They think they're like the witches. The government enacts some laws so that they can't practice like the really bad version in their view of witchcraft. But mo but mostly that is not what was happening. They were using remedies to cure earaches. They were using spells to find lost items, things like that. The general magic user at this time really is mostly being left alone. 
by the church and not being judged by wider society. The, the general user of folk magic or folk remedies in this era is going to give you a spell to help you find your lost treasure. None of that is seen as a problem. None of that is seen as anti-Christian at the time. There is a sequence of charms, for example, um, intended to help a farmer find his lost cattle. So practitioners would appeal to the elements of the earth or other supernatural sources to help them determine the place of the lost cows. So during this era, Christianity is not really all that worried and not all that concerned with the overall the general practitioner of folk practices or folk magic. They're not being persecuted right here. Um, it's just seen as useful. Farming in the Middle Ages was a lot of hard work. Um, you needed a lot of knowledge. You needed favorable weather conditions and, and maybe a little grace from God. And so this was their way of appealing to that grace. Um, when faced with a difficult problem, medieval peasants, they would turn to magic for a solution. A book that discusses the Anglo-Saxon farming practices actually says this. Charms provided a sense of agency and a course of action when faced with overwhelming odds. Traces of these kinds of superstitious beliefs can still be found in the agricultural world today. My father, the quote says, grew up on a farm and still comes out with sayings like, make hay when the sun shines, or plant after the first full moon in May, or don't count your chickens before they're hatched. These are actually sayings grounded in the same appreciation for the overwhelming power of the natural world and the same desire to find a bit of control in it. We still say those things today, things that were akin to kinds of spells or folk magic that they would say back then. Um, pictured here, you can see an example of a, a farming charm, um, and this one is actually found in a leech book. Um, the translation of this, I did not do this translation, but here's what I'm told it says. This is to help a farmer. Before dawn, cut four pieces of turf from four sides of the field. Note where you got them from. Then mix together oil, honey, yeast, milk from each and every one of the cattle. A piece of every tree on the property, except the hardwood trees, of course. A piece of every kind of plant except buck beans and some holy water. Drip some of that mixture onto each side of the turf you cut up while repeating a Latin blessing. Next, this is the spell that goes on. Head to the church and get the priest to sing four masses over the turf. Be sure that the green side is pointed at the altar. Once the priest is done, head home, and before the sun sets, take the turf back to where you got it, then carve sayings into the four pieces of Christ's flower made from four different quick bean trees. Put those in the holes and then put the turf carefully back on top. Remember, these were mostly good practicing Christians. I know that spell sounds crazy to you. That's how you that's how a farmer was being advised to to manage his field. I know that sounds crazy to you and that these are magic beliefs, but they were being practiced by good Christian people all throughout the centuries, and they were widely accepted as just the way things were. They just didn't have enough of a scientific worldview to challenge those ideas. You and I sit back and do that easily in 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 one second. But they didn't have any of that kind of thinking available to them back then. So the people at this time, they were doing the best they could to solve their very real world problems, especially common issues that popped up a lot. So in these spells, in, the, in these medieval books, kind of these Christianized pagan practices, the most frequent spells and charms we see are for managing unfruitful land to fight against dwarves. Apparently, that was a problem. Um, they say to to manage, they call it a win, to manage a win, which is like a skin blemish or, or maybe a rash. Um, they had charms for difficult journeys. They had charms to help the beekeepers. You might have heard of the phrase bee charmer. It's, um, it's actually, it's in our popular culture a little bit. You There's movies that refer to someone being a bee charmer. Well, that. This is a charm, you said, for the beekeeper to, to be able to make good honey. Um, 
there were three three times the amount of charms for the loss of cattle. You have to imagine this was a very practical problem they were trying to solve. They didn't have fencing like we have today, so they would lose a lot of cattle. So they needed a practical solution to solve this. Um, my favorite one, though, that they write spells for is for something they call water elf disease. And as far as we can tell, it, it, some disease where you look pale, your nails start to look ill, and you have watery eyes. So they got a lot of charms to cure water elf disease. They must have cured it because I don't think we have that disease anymore. Um, so you can see they're they're grappling with all of these problems. They're trying to find solutions for them that satisfy both their spiritual beliefs and the physical world that they have to grapple with. They're using remedies in ways that are pretty unfamiliar to you and to I to solve problems. But their problems are also ones that we're pretty unfamiliar with. Most people are not farmers anymore, and they're not worried about how to make a field more fertile. Most people are not cattle ranchers, but even the people who are probably have more effective ways of finding their cattle than saying a charm. So we can judge the people of the past really harshly for this if we wanted to, or we could try and understand their world and why they thought this made sense. Even the church at this time, um, the, the Catholic and the Christian church at this time, they looked at these as if they were no problem at all. This is a quote from a, Jes a Jesuit leader at the time. He says, there are as many types of natural magic as there are subjects of applied sciences. This is nothing else but the highest power of the natural sciences. So they were practicing what we look down on and call folk magic. But what they thought they were doing was harnessing the, patrol, the power of natural sciences. You have to imagine that if, if humanity is alive 500 years from now, they're looking back at us and saying, oh, those people were not practicing real science we today, 500 years later, we are the ones who practice real science, sort of looking to, looking down on our culture because certainly scientific knowledge would advance in 500 years. So we kind of look down on these on these middle age people and, and these people in the Middle Ages, but they didn't think that they were doing something that was crazy. They thought it made sense. So we we're gonna pivot a tiny bit from the general Middle Ages and talk about the Crusades, because the Crusades actually play a really important role in this story. If you remember, we're trying to tell the story of how did we get from the end of Bible times to Joseph Smith's day with this intact understanding of how God works in the natural world through things we might call folk magic. So the Crusades actually have a really important role here. The effects of the Crusades are actually far more interesting than the Crusades themselves. Um, you can study the battle and the patterns and the maps of all of it. But during the Middle Ages, the Crusades played a significant role in fostering cultural exchange and the blending of ideas between different civilizations. It hadn't really happened in this way. Um, despite having tra established trade routes, the, the Crusades kind of blow up this idea of globalization in sort of its Middle Ages form. So as European crusaders ventured into the Middle East on their crusade, they also came into contact with the advanced cultures of the Islamic world at the time. This interaction led to the transformation of knowledge, art, science. It took all of those discoveries in the East and people brought them back with them to the West. For instance, the Europeans were introduced to Arabic numbers algebra, various medical advancements, many things like this. They had no idea about their, during the Dark Ages, society had not really been progressing in knowledge in the West. The Crusades took them to people who had developed that knowledge because they were living in a different context. Well, the Crusaders bring it back with them. Um, they are facilitating trade and commerce between different regions, further promoting the exchange of these ideas. So things are starting to spread. This is well before the Renaissance, um, but we can start to see humanity sort of wake up a little bit right here from the Dark Ages. This impacted religious beliefs too, and their magical beliefs. They bring back fresh ideas on healing spells because they have a wider variety of herbs and spices that they got in contact with. There's a whole new level of spells and charms are developed in this era. So it's, it's almost like they take a step forward in knowledge and then they also take a step forward of trying to incorporate that knowledge 
into their current worldview, their current understanding of how God works, and they do this in the form of these spells and charms. So, so what's even really actually happening in these charms, right? We modern people would say plants and herbs really do have some properties that would promote healing. Whether or not those plants and herbs work against dwarves or water elves disease, that's a different story. But you and I, modern scientifically minded people, could say, oh, this plant has this property. We rec- Many of our medicines are made from plants. We recognize that. They were able to notice the properties without having the scientific language to describe what's happening. So they had much less science knowledge than we had, and they still were recognizing this spice does this, this herb does this. So they attribute those properties or those magic, as they would think of them, to God. And this was true for most of Christianity during this era. They believed in God and saw no conflict between that and understanding that certain herbs had certain properties, which they didn't understand, but they could use. They attributed that to what we would call folk magic, but they called it recognizing God's work in the world. Um, Again, this is an era where the church really isn't paying too much attention to the use of charms or spells or herbs. Um, The people like them. The people like feeling like they have remedies. Um, They like to be able to go to someone and get something to help with their ear infection. Um, nobody, Nobody in this era is really arguing against the use of magic, not for infections, not for finding lost items. It just made sense to them. Things will change significantly as we get closer to the Renaissance, though. But first, we need to make a little stopover um, in the Inquisition. Of course we do. If you've listened this this far, no doubt you, you know what's coming here, right? Um, before the Inquisition, the church, the church had a system for keeping heretics in line. And it, it, it's kind of like church court and church jail is, is really the essence of what it was. But it was mostly used for clergy who had become heretics. Um, I'll put you in jail until you change your belief is sort of how that played out. It usually didn't involve torture. Um, heretics were seen as like a an antisocial menace and not necessarily as being devil worshipers or, or practicing the occult. It was a problem because they were the clergy, the leader of the church, the leaders above them wanted them to have a particular belief. And when they didn't have that belief, that is called heresy. And they were sent to church court and then church jail. However, <laughs> by the 12th century, there's an increase in more organized um, hunting down of heresy, and there's more clergy participating in this. So instead of the archbishop kind of over an area being able to be the one to decide, um, if some does someone need to be sent to church court? Um, they set up the these inquisitors or these inquisitions to sort of sort things out on a more local level. They were, they were called the Episcopal Inquisitions, and bishops and archbishops were tasked with visiting all the areas of their territory at least twice a year for the specific reason to root out heretics and bring them to inquisition. So we get this shift here. It's not the church is mostly turning a blind, they mostly don't care about spells and charms and folk magic. They really only cared if a clergy member was teaching a belief that wasn't the official belief of the the church. So we see this start to shift here. The church leaders are actively going out and looking for things that could be labeled heresy, and the definition of heresy starts to grow. We're still certainly dealing with issues of theological heresy, but over time, it really starts to, they start being interested in magic and in witches. we'll, We'll come back to the witches in a minute. Um, timeline, we're talking about the Renaissance. So sometimes we think of the Renaissance as like this really quick pivot point, a really, a, a really sharp turn where the world went from a magical worldview to a scientific one. But it was a much, much longer process than that. During the Renaissance period, magic and, and even occult practices, things that they at that time would call occult practices, they underwent significant changes that reflected the shifts in culture, intellect, and religious perspectives. 
you're probably familiar with C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is a an expert in the end of the Middle Ages period, and his work on English literature, he highlights the transformation of how magic was perceived and portrayed. Like in medieval stories, magic had this fantastical, like fairy tale like quality, while in the Renaissance, it's become this really complex. It's tied to the idea of hidden knowledge that could be exploited through certain rituals or practices. So it kind of goes from it. We don't totally know how this works. It's almost fantastical to to something that that's looking at looking for things that are quite a bit darker. And in this era, like the 15th and 16th century, both the middle class, the bourgeois and the nobility, they showed great fascination with the various kinds of magic as, at this time, especially some of the things that come, came from Arabia, um, Jerusalem, Egypt. These were great, like distinguished practices is how they were presented. But the church over time starts to see them as these vain superstitions, blasphemous, occultism. They, they, they start to kind of cast some doubt on them. So magical beliefs continued in the Reformation, but they're waning. So Martin Luther said um, that with the help of the devil, witches could steal milk by merely thinking about a cow. All right. So Martin Luther, one of the great leaders of the Reformation, clearly he's got a vision of, of what is to come. And he still is worried about this, that witches can think about cows and still milk that way. So it's it's kind of this tension back and forth, and we're going to continue to see that pattern later, uh, like eighteen or I'm sorry, fifteen thirty eight. Um, it's reported there was much discussion about witches and sorceresses who poisoned chicken eggs in the nest or poisoned milk and butter by poisoning the cow with their minds. Um, Martin Luther said. One should show no mercy to these women. I would burn them myself. For we read in the law that the priests were the ones to begin the stoning of criminals. Like so, so by this point, Martin Luther, he both believes that they can do it and that they should be severely punished for it, that they should stop doing it. But you can kind of see the tension in him. In this era, there's also a new interest in the old Greek and Roman texts. So during the Renaissance, those kind of get a revival, and many of those contain the magical worldview, as we have talked about. By the end of the 1500s, we get a guy, a guy like John Dee. He was a British mathematician. He was the court astronomer to Elizabeth I, and he had a belief that man had the potential for divine power and that that power should be exercised through mathematics. All right, so we see we see this funny transition period it's no longer man has the ability to tap into divine power and this should be done through him collecting four pieces of sod off his property and have the priest bless them john d says you absolutely have the the ability to tap into divine power and you do that through math so we're getting we're getting the mixing and the growing of beliefs here d is said to have wanted to commune with the angels through the power of mathematics I've never communed with an angel through the power of mathematics. Maybe you have, but that's how they were thinking in this era. You can see the blending of old magical ways of thinking and newer scientific thinking. Um, it's starting to happen, but it's still mixed up and weird. But still, even at this point, no one is questioning that folk magic or magical beliefs are important to pay attention to. Nobody's even talking about that yet. So overall, the Renaissance begins to demystify magic with some level of scientific understanding. But still, we're, we're going to go through another pendulum swing here and watch how this happens. If You probably see this coming if you know history, and, and this is the era of the witch trials. So the witch trials are this very weird counterexample here. In the Renaissance, we see humanity grow towards more knowledge. And it seems like the era of the witch trials, things have gone backward quite a bit. It, I think really what it is, is the magical beliefs, the beliefs in folk magic never went away. It just started to mix. And if you didn't mix them quite enough in this era, people are going to start to get mad. So, of course, we modern people, we look back on the, the stories of the many different kinds of witch trials, and we see lessons about like the danger of mass hysteria. 
that's probably the, the lesson we learned from like the Salem witch, witch trials or maybe the power of accusation. But in that day, there was a serious question about was a, what was actually going on with magic. So, for example, the Salem witch trials this is a dark chapter on American history. Everything that that took place around that time were in like late 17th century America, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, the trials begin because a group of young women in Salem um, accuse many individuals of practicing witchcraft. There does not seem to be actual evidence that they that these people believe themselves to be witches or that anyone else was calling them witches. What they probably were practicing was some kind of folk practices or folk magic that were actually rather common still for that era. But the accusations spread rapidly, leading to the establishment of some special church courts to handle the cases. And, and you can see here, we're very much in the era where there's growing anxiety over anything that seems a little bit too magic. So over the course of several months in Salem, 200 people were accused of being witches, and 30 of them were put to death. So there's this tension back and forth. Um, we believe in science. No, we still believe in magic, but now we're just afraid of it. So due to its popularity in movies and literature, like, we tend to think of the Salem trials maybe as the biggest or the most important witch trials, but really there were lots of them happening all over Europe. And many of them happened much earlier. Than, Salem is actually a little late in the timeline for witch trials. By the time we get to 1609, this is, you know, a hundred more years or earlier than Salem, the Catholic Church is really in full-blown witch hunt mode in Europe. Um, there's a story, they call them the Basque witch trials. Basque is a region in Spain. Um, the Inquisition there caught 7,000 people in it. Um, only six of them were sentenced to death as being actual witches, but the rest of the 7,000 had to withstand a, a church court trial to find out if they were witches or not, and what they probably were doing are the same common folk practices that everybody else was doing. If they couldn't admit they were a witch, they were put to death, or if they couldn't explain what they were doing, they were put to death. Um, most of the people in that particular circumstance, the Basque witch trials, they confessed to witchcraft and were let go. That was the deal. You confess, we'll let you go. So they confess as witches. It's seen as this bad thing, but the folk practices they were really doing were being done by lots of other people, but those people have got the message. These practices are going to get you into trouble. So we continually see some shifts in how this is happening. We're getting closer a little bit to Joseph Smith's time, and we are still very much in the era of of grappling with these practices. They're, they're actually, I'll, I'll tell you one more. There, there were some small scale witch trials as well. For example, um, a woman in Ireland named Bridget Clary, she was beaten and burned to death by her husband because he believed that fairies had taken the real Bridget and replaced her with a witch. So he kills his wife because he believes she's a witch impersonating his real wife. His real wife is safe somewhere, and this is the witch, and so he kills her for it. Um, and maybe that's a very small-scale witch trial, but it is an example of like perhaps his wife was probably participating in folk magic practices just like the entire rest of her culture. Her husband cannot figure out that this doesn't make her a witch, but he sees the practices, worries that it is a witch, concludes that it must be, and, and, and murders her. During this whole era, witches are starting to be seen as in league with the devil and must be killed. But how they're defining witch is really, usually, a woman who is practicing folk remedies. Sometimes during this era, they're calling it everyday magic. Um, they're certainly still calling it folk magic in this era. They're, they're still solving their everyday problems. They're using the charms. They're using all the spells. They're still finding their lost cattle and uh, making infertile land fertile th through, through these practices. So in this era, there was also acceptable study of the natural phenomena in general with no evil or irreligious intent whatsoever. So in general, if you were going to apply magic to solve real world problems, it was still okay as long as the church didn't think you had crossed the line into making a pact with the devil. Same same practices, 
the church was really worried about the spiritual side of it. So we're gonna we're gonna fast forward a little bit more right now into the Enlightenment and the first great awakening. If you know Joseph Smith's hi- history, you know he's alive during the second great awakening. So we're getting closer to his time. The Age of Enlightenment is said to have begun when Descartes utters the words, I think, therefore I am. And that's in 1637. But that's pretty early. And these thoughts have to have to develop for quite a while before they're really recognized as the Enlightenment. And there's debate about when this era actually ends. But one common way to think about that is the Age of Enlightenment ends with the beginning of like the Napoleonic Wars, the the French Revolution, kind of that era. That's it's 1804 is when the Napoleonic Wars begin. Interesting enough, Joseph Smith is born in 1805, and we're very much still in the era of across the globe, some folk magic practices being widely accepted in society. And as long as you weren't making pacts with the devil, nobody really was bothered. The belief in power of witches and sorcerers to harm kind of begins to die out in the West. They have a conceptualization of witches, but they start to think maybe they actually can't do anything because maybe they're not actually real. In earlier times, Christians disbelieved in witches um, because Christ had already defeated the powers of evil. They didn't need a witch to do it, but that doesn't mean they didn't use the same herbs and spices and remedies that the witches were using. They were just doing it with different motivations. But for post-Enlightenment Christians in the West, in, in Northern Europe, the disbelief was based on rationalism and empiricism more than being countered with a spiritual belief. So post-Enlightenment People are starting to say things like, I don't believe in witches because magic is not real, right? You you and I would utter that sentence today, right? Whereas before the Enlightenment, they made a spiritual understanding of, I don't believe in witches because Christ has already defeated evil, so how can an evil witch exist? Part of the response to that was called the First Great Awakening, and it, it roughly starts in about 1740. Um, right before Joseph Smith's time, he he lives in the Second Great Awakening. But during the First Awakening, people, especially this is the United States, is where both of the awakenings really start and flourish. People were being called back to their spiritual side. That's what is awakening. The preachers of that era, kind of fire and brimstone preachers, we read their words as extraordinarily harsh, but they're trying, they see themselves as trying to wake everybody up. Um, thus the great awakening Um, and along with that comes a new kind of acceptance for some old spiritual practices that we might call magic so in 1740 the first great awakening the realm of magical beliefs stood at kind of this crossroad you can see it's gone back and forth science magic science magic and we're at another crossroad caught between the the fading remains of kind of the enchanted past and the beginning of the scientific enlightenment. So the, the tug of war is very much still going on. We're, we're almost to Joseph, but we got to talk about one more thing first. This is movement called romanticism. This is a, a reaction to the enlightenment. The enlightenment emphasized reason and logic. Romanticism prioritizes emotion, imagination, individualism, art, beauty, painting, um, dance. Romantics sought to explore the depths of human existence, emphasizing personal feelings, intuition, deep appreciation for the nature for the nature natural world is is embedded in all of this. We see it in like Victorian England. They're sort of obsessed with nature during this era. It's in their art, it's in their music, it's in their literature, lots of our Christian hymns written in this era extol the virtues of thinking about nature as a way to know God. If you look at some of those hymns, they're very much trying to tell you God is speaking to you through the natural world. We scientific-minded people still stand and look at a mountain in awe and think, God created this beautiful world for us. God wants us to know he's there. 
for like, like like whatever like we still are attributing the natural word world to the goodness of god and that's what they were trying also to do in the romantic era they really were celebrating the individual's connection to the divine as mediated through the more emotional things like art and music and literature but we also see some secular versions of this happening too. This is the same era Hans Christian Andersen is writing. He writes his fairy stories. People can't get enough of them. This is post-Enlightenment. He He's reaching back to an era before the Enlightenment when fairy stories could make sense of the world. Like People are still in the tug of war. Um, the love of nature in the Romantic era was a about how nature is uncontrolled and unpredictable. And this was a reaction to what they felt was sort of this overly ordered world that the Enlightenment had produced. The Enlightenment wanted you to believe that every single thing in the world was completely understandable. Nothing like magic ever has or ever could exist. There, There is nothing that is unexplainable, nothing that's a miracle, nothing that... Um, and emotion is just simply chemicals in enlightenment kind of thinking. So in the in the romantic era, we're seeing this huge reaction to beliefs that also align with what we have been calling folk magic. So in this in this era, I, I mean, I'm sure you are familiar with some of these. They have a practice called blood stopping in this era. A, a person could be stopped from bleeding by reciting Ezekiel 16.6. They were using it like a charm. The person performing the blood stopping um, had been given the power to do so, they believed, and their gift was mostly passed down to opposite sex, father to daughter, daughter passes it to son, that reciting Ezekiel 16.6 would have the power to stop blood. And I know, I mean, you and I both are thinking that is not how you stop blood, but they're going back to these earlier beliefs. They had something, a belief they called the Jonas. This was a 19th century fisherman, like think Massachusetts. They were, they were eager to avoid individuals, ve- vessels, objects identified as Jonas. They were cursed with bad luck. So if a fisherman was a Jonah or if a boat was a Jonah, this was a big problem. So they would place a spell or a charm over like, their, their catches, if they happen to have a particularly poor catch and they identify it as a Jonah catch, that might curse the vessel. It might curse the fisherman on the vessel just because it was a bad catch. You and I would look at that and say, well, gosh, the, the ocean currents or the temperature or the, the fish have moved on. They see it as curses and, and contagious cur- curses, actually. In ambiguous cases, a Jonah could be identified by a ship's cook Putting a, he would put a nail in a piece of wood or a lump of coal in a loaf of bread. And like that was his warning to the others. This might be a Jonah ship. Sometimes he puts the lump of coal in the bread and whoever gets that piece of bread, they're the actual Jonah who needs to be cast off of the ship. Probably let off in a port, not cast into the water. Um, but that's how they solved the problem of a bad catch. Like, it doesn't make any sense to us, but it did to them. It, this is also the era when we have a lot of use of divining rods. Um, sometimes this is called dousing. In South Dakota, for example, late 19th, early 20th centuries, the homesteaders were absolutely using dousing rods. This is very well documented. It's happening all over the world. This is just one example. Farmers and ranchers are locating water wells on their property. There are people today still who have something that they would call a dousing rod and make claims that they are able to identify water. What your scientific mind does with that, I don't know. I get skeptical of that. But if you can see this has been practiced for history forever, it's not like the guy with the dousing rod is making it up today. He's practicing a particular cultural tradition that the rest of society has moved on from, but he himself didn't come up with it and is some crazy person. Interestingly enough, even the United States military, after the First World War, they hired people with a divining rod to help them find water. Even in the late 1960s, in the Vietnam War, some United States Marines used dousing when trying to locate weapons or tunnels. As late as 1986, 31 soldiers were taken by an avalanche um, in a NATO operation in the Arctic. It, Norway is sent for the rescue. The Norwegian army attempted to locate the soldiers. They're buried in the avalanche. No one can find them. Someone in the Norwegian army finds them with a dousing rod. 
This is 1986. Right? I was alive by then. Maybe you were too. It's not all that long ago. These beliefs carry for long times. And yes, history vacillates back and forth. The pendulum swings. But we humans seem to be going through a process over many, many years of trying to figure out how does the physical world and the spiritual world work together. So enter Joseph Smith. And I think you can see by now how thinking about magic leading up to Joseph Smith's time, it's not really some strange and sp- thing to be suspicious of. It's a thing to understand in history. It's right in line with what was happening all over the Western world. And Joseph was born into that culture. His early life in the 19th century in, in, in rural New York would have indeed been filled with all kinds of folk beliefs and practices. They had real world problems to solve. They had faith in God. They believed that God used items in the natural world to help them. And that is absolutely the underpinning of these kinds of beliefs. These practices were common among Americans, not only in his New York context, but all over the inhabited parts of America at that time. Um, And they were still being used for finding lost items, determining the location of buried treasure. We've stopped fighting water elf disease by this era, but Joseph is born into a culture that still believes in being able to use certain folk magic to find things like buried treasure. Now, Joseph and his family were known to have participated in some of these cultural practices. It was really not all that common with people in their community. They were not strange or weird for that. When we hear claims of, oh, they were scammers, they were occultists, they were all these things, historically, that doesn't really actually pan out as a claim because this is this is how history has been going for 2,000 years, frankly, before that. But in the 2,000 years of history, we have just covered this is how real world problems are managed by people who don't have yet a great scientific worldview. However, we also see some development in Joseph as he grew, especially after the first vision um, and receiving the golden plates, his focus starts to shift at first slightly and then significantly toward using spiritual means to solve spiritual problems while also still incorporating the natural world where it made sense. And it really is important to differentiate between the cultural context of his early life and his later religious teachings and revelations. He might have been born into this magical worldview, but he certainly takes a trajectory of development. And there, the, the accounts of Joseph participating in these practices, um, you might rightly call them folk magic, But it does not mean the scary witch made a pact with the devil kind of magic that you might think of. What it really means is using natural remedies, elements from the earth to ask God for healing. That's what they're doing. That's what the guy is doing when he picks up four pieces of turf, takes them to the priest to bless them. They throw some holy water mixed with other stuff on there. He takes them back and now his field gets to be fertile. That's the world Joseph is born into. And so in some ways, over the the span of Joseph's life or over the span of the life of a person who would not have had an early death like he did, born in the same year, would have lived quite a bit longer. You can see society is starting to to make the final push out of the magical kind of thinking. A, a person born in 1805 like Joseph was, they, they could have lived, what, 1880, something like that, if they had had a very long life. So if you think about it, the beginning of our modern kind of scientific medical treatment, it's often marked in 1928, which is when penicillin is discovered. And that's less than 50 years after a person joined the same or born the same year as Joseph might have died. So like all of humanity is almost on this, this precipice of great breakthrough in knowledge. They're not there yet. They're moving towards it. We see Joseph moving along with his society and we see him moving kind of faster and more towards his spiritual understandings. In the generation before Joseph, his parents' generation, they would have lived their entire lives treating sickness with folk magic. What else did they have? But two generations after Joseph, they would have been, they would have fully embraced modern medicine, vaccines, antibiotics. Society's changing anyway. And Joseph is born right at this very, very interesting era when 
God using physical items to speak to his people still has greater acceptance. As time goes on, we do see Joseph rely more on the Holy Spirit. So, besides being a fascinating romp through Western history, what's the point of telling you all these stories? Well, first, I hope it puts Joseph's use of a seer stone into some perspective. To our modern ears, the idea of a seer stone, it sounds crazy at best. But that's only because we live in an entirely different historical context than they did. We mostly don't believe in folk magic. And when we use practices that back then they might have called folk magic, we have the scientific understanding to explain what's happening in them. So we think we're doing something entirely different than they were, though often we're actually doing the same thing. We're just understanding it differently. In our next episode, we're going to narrow down this focus and move from kind of general magic practices to the actual specific practices that Joseph used and that were used in that era that might be labeled folk magic. But I also think it might spur some thoughts in you to think about how we, modern day believers, also actually rely on physical objects to help us understand how God speaks to us. One of the best and important things we do on a Sunday, for example, is take the sacrament. And we use very physical objects, bread and water, to communicate something spiritual. Would sacrament be the same thing if, if we didn't have the bread and the water? If we were just asked to sit in silence for 10 minutes and think about the Savior, that's a profitable 10 minutes. But it's not exactly doing what happens in the sacrament. At least I don't think it is. Using the physical elements of bread and water helps us gain spiritual nourishment. We are using physical things to commune with God. And that's a very kind and understandable way to explain our own behavior. But people who were accused of folk magic back then, they would have explained it the same way. They're using physical objects in a way God has directed or God has allowed or a way God communicates to them. And another example of this is when we're baptized, we use water, a very, very physical element. Would baptism be the same if it were simply a series of questions to answer? No. Going under the water is part of it. It's the physical world and the spiritual world meeting together and intersecting and something happens. It has an efficacious effect. The water has to be there. We are using it to mediate our relationship with God. In a sense, we're doing what God asked us to do, and we're understanding what baptism is because we go under the water. If you can step back far enough, you can see that people who have no knowledge of Christian faiths might be a bit shocked if they heard how we use water. You'd be like, wait, what? You, you use water to, to obey God? A physical thing to do a spiritual thing? It doesn't make any sense. You can't prove scientifically that that water is doing anything. They might think, our use of water in baptism is a kind of folk magic. You and I are completely comfortable with that. Part of what I'm trying to point out to you here is we're doing the same things that they did it. We have a scientific knowledge on top of it that they didn't have, but God has long spoken to his people through physical objects. Sarah did an amazing job in her episode on how he did that in the biblical scriptures. We can't say baptism is the same thing if there's no water. The bigger takeaway for me here is that Heavenly Father appears to be more than happy to use his physical world, the physical world he gave to us, in order to bring us back to him. And I think that's really beautiful. It, it's true in our day, it was true in Joseph's day, and it was true long before Joseph. Perhaps the best place to put focus is on the messages we receive from Heavenly Father and the Spirit. Focus on those teachings rather than on the methods of receiving those messages. We we certainly could understand reading the scriptures is one way to receive a message from God. Going out of the waters of baptism is another. The point isn't the method, reading in a book or, or being dunked underwater. The point is God is communicating something to you there. The method doesn't almost matter. It didn't really change anything about the Book of Mormon or our collective faith if Joseph translated through a seer stone or if the Book of Mormon just like fell to earth from heaven, fully complete and written. Either way, the important part of the Book of Mormon is what we learn about God in it, that he is communicating to us, that he's still speaking to his children, 
regardless of the means. And so there you have it. These practices have been practiced throughout history from Bible times right up through all of Joseph's life and beyond. I was surprised about the and beyond part specifically like that. That that really kind of threw me. Yeah, it, it makes me think of um, like astrology and, mm-hmm. and people like getting into tarot cards and things like that. It's kind of the same kind of vibe, isn't it? You know, um, it, Sarah, in your episode, you were talking about I remember one of the great quotes was something about the means doesn't matter as much. It mm-hmm. could be used for good or for evil. Now, I'm not saying tarot cards are a great way to go hear from God. I don't I don't think that that is a good thing at all. And right. I, I think the church has, has some things to say on that for sure. Um, but does the idea of using a physical object, because tarot cards are a physical object and that's bad, do we then say all physical objects are bad to commune with God? If we say that, why are we using bread and water for sacraments? Why aren't we just sitting and thinking about Christ's sacrifice for 10 minutes? Wouldn't that be the same thing? Except for that it wouldn't. Baptism wouldn't be baptism if it was just a series of questions that you have to Mm -hmm. affirm. Going under the physical water is part of it. So we still see um, human beings today, they did it in Bible times, they did it in the Dark Ages, they did it during the Renaissance, they did it during Joseph's time, they do it during our times as we use physical objects to understand God. I think that is absolutely fascinating, and um, I cannot wait to see what directions we go to next, because yep. that answered so many questions that I had. Yeah. Zach, I think you know where we go next. Yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about the events leading up to Joseph Smith using a serious stone. So what we're really going to launch into next is we're going to launch into the primary sources and a, a couple of other historical sources that kind of explain where Joseph was, like what what was the I, I called the mechanisms of translation, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. how often did he use the Urim and Thummim, how often did he use the seer stone, uh, kind of what the eyewitnesses seem to state. And so we've got a lot in store. And I'm super excited to get into it. Fantastic. Can't wait. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>